Hello, welcome to Hauser North Los Angeles. Thank you for coming. <coughs> I'd like to start just um, by thanking uh, Paul and Christian and Julian for all being here today. Um, all three of them have a really unique um, relationship to Jason and to this work. Um, I think many of you probably know that Paul was Jason's teacher at UCLA and collaborator uh, later on. And Julian was a student of Jason's um, in a class that Jason was the TA uh, and Richard Jackson was the teacher, I believe. Yeah. And um, Julian never saw this piece installed in Hamburg, but he did see uh, what Jason had built in his studio here before going to Europe and also had helped him uh, photograph his father's garden, which appears on the top level of the sculpture. And Christian was, uh, had a practice uh, uh, as a conservator and had a practice based in Hamburg and worked <coughs> with the Dichter Holland at that time uh, when Jason installed this work. Um, he now has a practice in New York and has spent a lot of time working um, closely with Jason's materials and other projects. Um, so I, I'm very grateful for them all being here today. And uh, I'm gonna start by asking um, just more of a broader question, which is what basically is illustrated in the perfect world and what was the experience of the work and how, how was the viewer positioned in this work? and how did that differ from how the artist positioned himself within 
the piece. <laughs> um, all right. Um, <clears throat> well, I was kind of thinking today about the piece, and I had, you know, it's been quite a few years, and um, it kind of struck me something. Should I keep Can you move going? Move the mic a little closer. Yeah. Oh, Perfect. Okay. Yeah. There you go. I, you know, maybe I, I didn't plan on starting it off this way, but since you asked that question, then maybe it makes sense. Um, I was thinking uh, about perfect world in the sense that it's a, a, a sort of area underneath and then a very fragile uh, layer uh, that <clears throat> Jason, in a way, had created for himself, I think, like he <laughs> describes it as something that two people could go up into. And then the bottom area is where the viewer could go. And the top area was the area, uh, a kind of perfect world for the artist. And there's a lot more that could be said about that. And I'm sure we'll get into it. But so it's an area for the artist. And then at one point, I remember uh, there was these buckets that you could throw garbage down through, and uh, it could land down into the area of the viewer, in a sense, throwing garbage down onto the viewer. But I don't think, so the viewer was down below, so I don't think that it was really uh, that harsh. I don't think he intended it to drop things on their head, but that fragile area upstairs, you could, you know, it's obvious that piece of paper going over holes. If the artist is up there, he could fall through. So it's a, a kind of precarious layer and fragile. So I, I was thinking about this layer down below and this area up above. And, um, and that the artist is above and the area below. And then it was, it kind of struck me that uh, Mike Kelly, when he did Homestead, uh, had an area underneath in which uh, other people could go into. It, it, a, a doomsy, I mean, a kind of pretty uh, dark basement area that you could enter. But it was, and he has, said that he wanted people to go down there and make work. In a sense, then, the viewer, for the most part, goes up above, and then there's an area for artists down below. Mm -hmm. And, but it's not just <laughs> for one artist to work, as Jason's more or less is. It's for other artists to go and make pieces. So it's a kind of interesting thing of a viewer <coughs> above the artist below, but more than one artist. And in a way, saying, I think Jason's is a private space, and Mike is giving a space away. And then I made a piece called Pig Island. And on Pig Island, the art is below, and the viewer goes up above. And in my case, the viewer is allowed to shit on the art, or pee on the art, or look down through the hole onto the art. So it's a different position. It's a position where the viewer is above and can shit on the art, or look down. Jason did say at one point that the artist could shit or pee onto the viewer down below. So it's a... Uh, it's a switch. In my case, the art and the artist get shit and pissed on by the viewer. In Jason's case, the artist shits on the viewer. And in Mike's case, I don't think there's any shit. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's interesting that without really being conscious of it, uh, these are three kind of iconic positions in which artists play in which the viewer plays. 
And it's, I think, in Jason's world, he's creating the perfect world for the artist. In my case, it's about the degradation of art by the viewer. In Jason's case, it's the artist. And um, so I don't know whether that answers. That's a, something I was thinking about today. Um, do you want to go next? Or? No, no. <laughs> uh, is this good? Or? Yeah. Um, I, I, well, as you said, I never saw the piece, um, but I saw parts in the studio when I photographed the garden and saw a lot of video. And, and um, when, when I was, uh, Sabrina gave us transcripts of these interviews of Jason, uh, where he talks about the piece at length. And I, the thing I, I kept thinking about is um, he's calling it the perfect world and it's a garden. So there, there's an obvious reference to Eden and to Christianity that, that seems to jump out. But in the transcript, in the different moments where um, the interviewer asks him about that aspect, he, he says he's not that interested. That there's a link to these big mythologies, um, but he's not that interested. And that he's interested in something else. And he says another thing which I thought was, was, was very beautiful and very eloquent with respect to that, um, namely that for him the, the perfect world is not an, uh, a world it's not perfection in, you know, we, we, we identify perfection as a kind of stasis. It's a sort of death. Uh, a thing is perfect when it doesn't evolve, um, when it won't evolve, when it'll just stay the same infinitely, and, it, and it's attained a, a perfect state from which it can't move. Um, Jason's perfect world is the opposite of that. It's, it's uh, as Paul was saying, it's, it's, a, it's a top layer that's precarious, literally, um, I mean, you could literally fall through. Um, and, it's, and it's the site of an ongoing activity, not only during the show, um, but after, because the elements of the perfect world, I think, as we might see later, kind of filtered into other, other pieces. Um, and, and he says somewhere in the transcript, he says something, it's, 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 not, uh, it's not an ideal world, it's an ideal, it's a world where all these problems can sort of be accommodated, you know. Um, and that to me is really interesting, not just in terms of religion, uh, but also in terms of art and art history, because we, you know, whatever modern or contemporary art is, it's, it's art that comes at a moment where the big, at least in, in Western society, the big narratives collapsed or have collapsed for, you know, since the Reformation. And, and Every artist, every movement, every group has to con construct every time a frame for whatever they're doing. They have to contextualize it. And um, in the, the famous essay by Walter Benjamin on reproducibility and the work of art in major mechanical reproduction, that's an aspect of what he calls aura that, that, that gets a bit lost in that essay because um, Benjamin contrasts a, a painting in a church, like in Italy, a painting that was made for the church with a, a, the reproduction of that painting circulating as a postcard in a book and a film, you know, all, all the, the, the work that we know that's tied to reproducibility. And he talks about the loss of aura, but aura is not just um, presence, like the painting in the church in Italy that was made there for that place. It's a lot of other things. It's, uh, uh, aura is a kind of setting, like almost like the setting of a jewel, you know, it's, it's a, it's the place, it's the context, it's a cultural framework. It's all those things that, that made it so that people who visited that church in Italy for hundreds of years automatically read the painting without any difficulty because they shared that frame. That frame was, was shared. And, and Jason's operating eons <laughs> after that moment. And what he's doing is he's, he's, he's proposing another kind of perfect world and it's not a perfect world that's where all the tensions and problems are resolved through some overarching narrative or um, even an overarching perspective because that's actually the key thing in a, in a way it seems about this work it's a thing of perspective um, he multiplies everything 
he multiplies the perspectives, he multiplies the details, he multiplies the narratives, he multiplies the references, he puts himself, he puts his father, and, and he's also constructing a work which is um, at the same time very simple, formally somehow for, for him. It's, it's essentially, he describes it as a flat work, and it is, it's like a big picture. But it's a flat work through which the audience pops up one or two at a time and then sinks, sinks down. Um, he pops up and then he, has all, he had all those decoys that you saw, which from what I understand were sometimes thrown down. So decoys of himself fall down. Um, but there's the big piece, there are models of the piece in different scales. Every, every, you, there's not, there isn't a viewpoint from which you can see everything, even if you're on top. You can't see what's under the panels. And that's a very simple thing, but it's, but it's, it's an incredibly complex um, and subtle break from um, not just monotheism and stuff, but, it, but even something like art history. You know, we, we read works of art in terms of a big narrative um, of art history, of forms, of styles, of, of, of ways of making work. Um, and Jason is arguing for works that could be informed by that, but could also be informed by something in your life or something you encounter or something that happens when you do, when you were working there. Um, and that's also seen differently in terms of whoever is seeing it and the perspective that they were able to have on the work because the work is always evolving. Um, and so, yeah, that's <laughs> mm. something. <laughs> but, um, usually in, in medieval illustrations, the perspective towards the paradise is always from above. There are these beautiful illustrations the, from uh, the author's conclusos where like God's eye looks into the paradise, into the animals, into the, uh, into the people. Um, I want to speak maybe a little bit about how it actually felt to be in the Deichtohallen at that time. Uh, so when the work was, I wouldn't say completed because it was never completed, um, but when the opening was and when the, the viewer, the, the audience was allowed in, uh, you felt <coughs> you walked through this uh, grid of uh, pipes and clamps and platforms and you always had to bend down and, uh, and then also the, the, the sound of the making was playing in the background, so a little <coughs> bit like uh, uh, Robert Morris, the box of its own making, the box with the sound of its own making. Um, but you felt a little bit excluded from paradise uh, because there were only, like there were these two very uh, flimsy <laughs> lifts that could only take one or ideally one person. <coughs> and then you could go, yeah, there was a long line and not everybody could go up. And, and then you were there and there was, there was no artist. The, there was just a snake <laughs> and there were some of these dummies, but the paradise, paradise was empty. <coughs> and uh, I mean, this, this maybe is a good moment to speak about the, the difficulties, the problems that uh, had to be faced in making this work. I don't know if you want to speak about this earlier. Um, it, it, was, it was really difficult uh, for Jason to achieve this uh, structure because the, the museum or the Deichtohallen, they did not have all the money for, to, to make the work. To, they did not provide, you could see in the, in the film, there were maybe seven people working in the whole installation. Uh, the supply did not arrive, the pipes did not arrive in time, and when they arrived they were not polished, so they had to be polished, and the Deichtohalle said, why do you want to polish them? We don't have time, and Jason said, this is really important. Mm -hmm. So you always had to fight for everything. Um, the, the platforms were made in a little factory outside of Hamburg, and they did not get the check from the Deichtohalle, so they, they could not deliver. So it was all very uh, difficult, and I think my role in this whole thing was to make sure that these people got the checks and that 
that <laughs> the, the production was happening because Jason's dream was to have a production line, like a like a real smooth production line, like the printing out very slowly, printing out the images of the garden, uh, uh, polishing the pipes, uh, putting up the everything was like had this rhythm and this accumulation, and that was disturbed by this institutional uh, unorganized uh, structure in a way. So it, in, a, in a way I would see, also see it as an institutional critique. Uh, Jason had this institutional critique. Yeah, that's something I think about a lot with this piece is um, Jason's relationship to institutional critique. And, um, I, do, I should context, contextualize a little bit also where this panel came out of, which is that um, we did a screening earlier in the run of the exhibition of archival material, and this was one of the films that we were planning to screen. And um, you know, it doesn't have an, much dialogue in it, and um, this is a piece that, of course, could never be recreated. It was, as you probably know, done in 1999 in Hamburg. Um, it was only seen by people who visited that exhibition. So. Um, I felt it was a, a film that needed a conversation around it. Um, this is such an elusive piece of Jason's and such an important piece in his work. Um, it's also interesting in relation to our show, which covers 1994 through 2006, um, which is the largest survey show to ever have taken place of his work here in LA, but um, it's also, it's 1994 to 1998, uh, the first three works, and then the the second set of three works is 2004 to 2006. So there's a, about a six-year gap there where um, the work really transforms. And you can see that very clearly in our installation that you work, walk into My Medina and Black Pussy and Tijuana Tangier Chandelier and something's shifted in the piece. Um, you no longer have Jason accumulating singular consumable consumer objects you have more um, industrial qual quantities of things. So, um, you know, thousands of clamps and thousands of poles. Um, and that was one of the things that interested me about having a conversation about this work is thinking about, you know, what changed for Jason over the run of this show or in preparation for this show and how his relationship to material changed. Um, and maybe also that uh, in previous works where he was accumulating a lot of different objects, perhaps here it's more about ac accumulating ideas and, and that the work is actually more ephemeral or exists more in the negative space of the exhibition in a way. So. Um, well, I guess it's my turn. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think it, you know, I know that this piece is talked about in the sense of it being a turning point in Jason's work. And, and I think, you know, the, you, you can break it down into certain categories, like early pieces having where there's actually a persona of some sort. And uh, the piece is worked through a character, and and then you get to this piece, and it it doesn't have the same type of collection of stuff and the same type of way of piling the work up or organizing the work. I mean, there's a certain it's a it's a system, and I think you know times even ref it's like a modular system, so. And then it's, it really involves like, like a production and physical labor. And I was watching it thinking, and I remember going there when it was being done and, and it didn't, it, you know, it was constructed with, with artists and, and people with some construction skills and knew about materials in that, but at the same time, the safety level to the whole thing was pretty crazy. And, um, but it, you know, and I was what, you know, people walking, you know, artists and, you know, preparators walking around with hard hats, 
and in a way, I kind of, they were kind of characters of a construction worker in a certain way, but mm. they're really not building uh, a building with OSHA standards. And there's a kind of, a kind of odd pretend nature or a performance going on. And, and I think one thing I was, when I was watching, I remember when I went, was there and they were polishing the, the uh, pipes which was really, I think, at that time, you know, Jason would be talking about Brancusi and, and the mirror. The mirror was, uh, you know, it, it's part of se a lot of 70s art and this reflection. And, and I was also, uh, I just mentioned that my piece, Pig Island, the top floor that the viewer is in, they're in like a kind of, top floor like a platform but it's surrounded by mirrors so when they're up there they just see themselves and um, I think it's kind of interesting that these pipes down below which are polished the viewer sees themselves right and uh, so there's this thing of the and then you know you think about Coons's things right now the ball and the reflecting the viewer reflecting the art. And in a sense, uh, you know, the, Jason's piece is about reflecting the viewer and reflecting itself, like you see the pipes in the pipes. And, but what was crazy and a really interesting part is that the machine that polishes the thing is, a, is called a Hammond. I think it's Hammond, I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then Jason had the idea, oh, well, I'll have a ham and organ there, too. And that object was really fantastic in that you had this ham and uh, polisher, and the pipe would go in and go over the top of the organ, and the guy would play the organ. And the crazy thing about that was you had the grinding of the, of the polishing of the pipe, and you had the guy playing the organ, and then the amount of ground up metal <laughs> in that room, which they didn't clean up. It was, the floor was like thick, and you would go in there and you'd get it just all over your hands. So these, these outlying rooms, the, the organ room, the Hammond room, the pipe polishing room, and then the printing room where they printed all the the garden uh, photographs, and it's really interesting how all that happened. And then you had the thing with the, the, the film. So you had these outlying, there was one other one. Oh, the sewing machine. Yeah. yeah, the sewing machine. So you had these outlying rooms, almost like mini industries, and then this big object being made. And uh, uh, I think, you know, and, and the, the a part, one part of, to me that's really interesting is that this type of work didn't exist really in America. Short of the 60s or the 50s and happenings, you didn't have these large pieces and they existed in Europe. And the sad thing is, is this piece is gone and it, you know, it's remnants of floating around like, I think on our porch we have a, a bus stop thing that he made with pipes from Perfect World. So these objects that had that these pipes were in are floating around in the world now, but the pieces are gone. And I was thinking about uh, that Howard Seaman had was really instrumental in Paul Tech showing the big installations at the end of his life. And he was also really instrumental in the career of Jason Rhodes in Europe, and in a way, you know, uh, responded to these types of installations, which, uh, you know, uh, never really existed in America. And in a lot of ways, Jason's work was never in America, you know. And, uh, and that has something to do with Although I think he really believed in working in Los Angeles and believed in what L.A. was, but in terms of 
support and in terms of understanding of his work that existed in Europe. You know. but, uh, oh, go ahead. I think it's, it's also uh, important to know that Jason was very well aware that underneath the floor of the Deichtohalle was another pipe structure. Uh, which yeah. so the Deichtohalle used to be a, like a flower uh, market, mm -hmm. and when you throw out the water on one side, it would end up in, on the other side of the of the of the hall. So it was it was a slanted floor, and when the Deichtohalle uh, were cons like renovated for exhibitions, the floor was leveled out. So, and I, I remember that uh, Stenik Felix showed him the basement, and so it, it, it must be considered that he built up this floor on top of another. Uh, of another. Yeah. And I think that's, that might I, be. I, I don't know how he came up with this structure, but what you said about the Hammond's organ uh, and exposing the pipes to music reminds me of the pickles being exposed to the Kevin Costner yeah. films. Yeah. So there must be some relationship in uh, I, I think mediation. there's something really interesting about the, 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 and the reference to his father in the garden, but this idea that you plant a seed and it grows, yeah. right? And there's this thing where, you know, whatever, Jason goes in there, Felix shows him the pipes and the seed starts to grow. And in a sense, you you know, uh, it is a type of rhizome going in all kinds of directions, and it comes from a seed, like an idea, and the garden becomes like the a metaphor for how art works that way, where you have an idea, an inkling of an idea, and before you know it, you have perfect world, and uh, you know, like that kind of. Uh, growth you know. yeah but, and but there was this whole process of photographing the garden yeah. um, which you were involved in Julian um, and I mean when did Jason become so interested in working in with photography in this way because as you see in the film there's this huge printing machine that's running all the time um, that takes a certain amount of you know knowledge base to run and computers and digital images and analog images so I um, I I just remember I, I was leaving LA and I think and he, he then he he had the idea for the for the piece and I went up north with him to his parents' house and we gritted out the garden with string as we were talking stakes yeah. and took pictures of and it happened very quickly because he didn't have a lot of time. Um, but I I uh, I think the I mean, it's 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 really interesting in the in the transcripts again that you gave me. The um, he he talks about this idea of trying to make a flat work and and of responding to the demand, the implicit demand for him to make a kind of flat work, and he makes instead of making the flat work that maybe say the market would have desired, he makes a, a flat work that's impossible that can only exist once, and then that that that's. That's oversized, um, right, but, the, but sorry. the platforms are flat, and so they can be reutilized. Right, right they can. Yeah. Be, but I'm saying the whole picture, the whole platform, only came together in that one moment. Mm -hmm. um, and the, I always took the the garden as as in in the same way that that in the pieces here, there's always uh, uh, a biographical reference, and and in a way you. You can, you can, as with anything in Jason's work, you can, you can look at that as, a, as, a, as, a, as something that he's emphasizing. Like, oh, it's, it's about him, it's about his childhood, it's about his biography. But actually, I think that's, that's sort of the wrong-headed perspective. Again, it comes back to this question of perspective because, uh, again, in the transcript, but in, I think in everything, that, that I've, in so many things that I remember Jason saying, um, he multiplies the perspectives in ways that sometimes veer into a kind of fiction or fable. You know, in, 
in, in a certain way, the garden has a perspective, you know, the vegetables have a perspective, the, the pipes are reflective, but they also have a perspective, people below, people above. Um, and it's not to show that there's a complete picture, but no one can see it. It's just to show that, that there are many complete pictures, but they're all from several, they're from individual perspectives. They always have a slant, they always have an angle, they always have a, a blind spot. Um, and, and, and I think he, he brought in photography in the same way that he brought in 16 millimeter film or that he brought in pipes or it's just a thing. It's a thing that he can use, um, that he can process through his work and, and move through. Um, but, but, but no one thing is, is I, I don't have, no one thing is more important than the other. When I, anytime you think that you can approach the work by looking at it from through this, the more you, prog you know, like his biography, the more you progress into looking at the work, reading what he said about the work, thinking about it, the more you realize actually it's just as important to think of the fact that the pipes are polished or that he had the organ or that there was dust on the floor or um, everything is an entryway and, and, and nothing is in a way, you know. Because I don't even know whether, like what Julia was saying about photography, I'm not even sure that he had like an interest in photography. It was just he had to make the photographic thing. Like I never remember Jason talking about this camera or that camera or being that interested. Even in drawing, he, I remember one point he could draw, but he asked me to draw something because I think he didn't want like he wanted, like drawing became like a tool, like just like the photographing, the garden, the camera was a tool. Wasn't like, it, he didn't have like an attachment to photography or an attachment to drawing or an <coughs> attachment to refer to what he was doing as an installation. I never remember him saying installation. He would say sculpture. And uh, you know, I don't think he, I ever remember him saying performance he would say an action or something like these were it's a, it's something to do with always stepping outside of that convention and uh, and looking for the the thing out here the idea out here like i think the photographs it wasn't the taking the picture was so important it was the idea that was important and uh yeah, but you also have this sense that the, the different rooms in the installation, which were outside of the main space of the Dijkdor Hallen, I think, um, you have the buffing <coughs> machine, you have um, the printing room, you have the room with the film, you have the sewing machine. So there's this, um, there's this way that he's um, referring to the development of machines over time and the rise of technology leading up into the moment of capturing an image and being able to project an image with film camera or... Right. Um, so I think this feeds into a larger question, like especially in the creation myth, which I think this work is really related to, you see him kind of straddling this world of analog and digital, and he clearly has like an interest in technology, and you know, I think at one point in an inter interview he says, I can't wait for the new Nintendo to come out because yeah. that's a cultural event. Um, so I, I'm curious also about um, just the way he engaged with this history and, and uh, development of technology in general in the work and what interested him about that. Well, there's just, uh, there's a passage actually, again, in the transcript, yeah. uh, but that's really nice because he talks about how, you know, um, I think he's talking about like digital cameras and computers and technology and he's saying how all this stuff moves so fast, but basically with the setup that he created for this piece, right. He's using that technology and making it really slow. Yeah, the printing machine. Yeah, because the printing machine is really slow, and and the speed at which it can print is the speed at which the platform will get covered, and that's it, and and that becomes a uh, uh, that becomes the time of the piece, right. and and that's um, yeah, that's something you can't d describe in a systematic way. It's just it's a it's a it, it's a way that Jason played with things. You know, he he would. He talks a lot about this idea of precariousness, but he could make something like technology or, or photography exist in this precarious balance within his piece simply by 
asking a printer to do too much, you know. And then all of a sudden the printer that's fast becomes slow, the camera that's fast becomes slow, you know, and then everything shifts. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, actually I met Jason in 94. Um, and so there was this guy working in the installation, it was called the Great Sea Battle of Wilhelm Schürmann. And he was installing, and there was uh, like a piece of uh, foam core with uh, black stripes around it, and that would suggest the temporary uh, Getty Center for Photography. <laughs> and 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 then there were uh, like little uh, uh, smoke puffs coming out once in a while, and so it, the whole installation, the Great Sea Battle. Uh, would talk about the discovery of uh, artworks by Wilhelm Schürmann. So occasionally he would he would have an uh, like an idea and would pops would like a smoke puff come out <laughs> and or like little ventilators like when he gets excited. So it was like very low key, like very low key technology, but it was all running very smooth and there were these cables and then there was a puff here and then he would look there and there was a puff there and something would move and then there were these uh, uh, plastic computers. They were made of plexiglass and they were just painted as if they were plastic computers. <laughs> and uh, so it, I was very, and then I asked him, are you the artist? And he said, no, I'm the assistant. <laughs> and, then, and then he explained further <laughs> and I said, well, maybe you are the artist. <laughs> so there was 94, but I was very surprised by the low-key uh, gesture of, uh, but everything was run. It was almost like a start-up company, no? like a garage start-up <laughs> company. And, and also, in a way, the Deichtorn installation is like, was almost like a start-up architectural Company and but it was very well thought out, very very well designed, and everybody knew exactly what they wanted, and there was great music, and everything was like running very smooth. Yeah. yeah. I, I was thinking that when you were talking, there was the whole thing of hands-on, and actually physically dealing with the model and physically, like there were several models made for Perfect World, I think like three or Yeah, four. I was gonna ask about this because I think there's three, he, he I makes think. a one quarter scale model of the piece in his studio here uh -huh. in Englewood. And that model is actually underneath um, Perfect World. It's in the exhibition. And on top of that sits a smaller model, which is like a maquette size model of the piece. And he, re so it's a small, a medium, and then he refers to the piece itself as the large model. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really interesting, this idea that the piece always stays in the form of a model, uh -huh. and also, um, like, what, maybe what is it that he's, do you think he's trying to model um, through this floor sculpture? It, uh, a perfect world. <laughs> a perfect world for the artist. Yeah. A, a subjective perfect world. He refers to it as a subjective perfect world. I mean, I think it feeds into this idea of like this continuous production and this continuous process, this idea that the work is never done. Um, and he talks about his entire career that way, is that, that it's all one process. Yeah, yeah, and you can, I mean, it's a weird reference, but if you think about, again, the, the Eden and the religious reference, um, it's it's a very funny way of thinking of a perfect world because it, you know Eden is a sort of original, and then we get kicked out of Eden and we're trying to make copies. But in his case, they're only models. You know, there's there's there are models that keep being made, remade, fragmented, disseminated. The question of like this origin that's lost or you have to be regained, this perfect thing that can't be changed, is not interesting. What's interesting is 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 um, is creating something that works for the time being, and then, in a way, and then making. Then you have to reinvent it when you set it up the next time, and you have to keep working on it. But that 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 moment where the thing is is together and being worked on and working and what 
what both of you were describing these like smooth, uh, smooth run, like running smoothly. That's probably the perfect world. You know, the perfect world is not when when it stops. It's it's the fact that it all the elements are there and they're working together somehow, and and that there's a balance. It's a it's um it's a kind of equilibrium that you have to regain and all the time. You know? I think there's something you know about you know like the fall from grace or the fall through the through the floor and. Uh, yeah, I was thinking that to some degree this thing to go above the view, go out above the viewer or out of above the masses and is some sort of, you know, I, I always kind of associated it with uh, some sort of attempt to freedom. Freedom to explore and freedom from the restrictions of normality or the society. You know, I, I remember at one point I, I re, Jason was talking and I said, "Well, that's you just want to. It's just about Paul Gauguin, you know, like it's the escape." And um, but something about that space up there being about freedom. And, uh, and a kind of perfect, you know, he, he talks about how the orange cords won't be disturbed in those videos, right? Like mm -hmm. somehow the work, he does this thing and then the people come into this space and they start moving the cords and they start interrupting and disrupting this thing that he's, you know, specifically and precisely and preciously and with passion is made and and uh, that's this idea of only two that you know he talks about only two people can come in at a time and it's really about you know something about really the process and the practice of making art and being an artist and uh, the importance of that to him maybe not to culture, who knows, but my view is culture shits on us, but it's, he has a different view, he's <laughs> going to rise above it, you know, but um, so, but something to do with freedom, and then in that comes the issue of morality and the fall from grace, and you know, the snakes, I, I, I think in, the, in that video he talks about the three layers and the one layer is where the masses is and where morality has been stated. Here's morality. And then above that, the artist escapes to a non-morality. But the snake goes in between the two. Mm -hmm. So those big tubes, which could pass down through the hole, could occupy both spaces. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then, of course, the fall, if he falls from the top, he falls back into conformity. Mm. So the fall from grace is the fall into conformity and normality. Mm. And the uh, perfect world is the escape from conformity. Mm. Yeah. Freedom, essentially, I think that piece is about freedom. Mm. But you, oh, no, no. I don't know. <laughs> No, I, I, I was just wondering, it seems like it's not like, a, it, it's about freedom, but it's not like a freedom that's um, completely outside. He's, he, it's like a freedom inside. Yeah. And, it, and, and it, again, it's this precarious thing that he, that he manages to float above the, the space, but in the space. He, and it's, he's not like, um, like Michael Heiser saying, I don't want to work in museums, I only want to work in the desert. That's not what he's saying or doing, he's, he's making this thing exist. And at the same, and that's maybe where the institutional critique part yeah. comes in, is, is in the demands that, it, that's a, I think that's an important thing. It's not the demands that he puts on the institution, it's the demand that the work puts on him and the institution and, and the viewer, but it's really the work putting these demands. The, that's where the, potential critique of the institution comes because either the institution can respond or it can't and oftentimes um, in, in my 
memories of working with Jason or, or seeing him work, it was not really things, I mean, it's something, it could be like a material financial thing that could pose a problem, but sometimes it was just like asking someone to do something with the piece every day, and then all of a sudden things froze, you know. Uh, just a, a demand to interact with the work, you know, a demand to have the work seen in a certain way. And, and, and in, in the, the tapes he talks about, he has this sort of ideal condition for how, the, how museums should function where they would only have two works, two shows a year. Yeah. People would buy a ticket once, but they could go multiple times. And then people could enter his installation, but only two at a time, which would be the bankruptcy of a museum, but it's also a beautiful uh, proposition. Yeah. And it would have been amazing. Uh. Yeah, I think this is a real problem that he's working through in this piece, and that he's feeling this pressure, like you said, Julian, to make flat works. And, and so he does actually make over 400 drawings for this show. But it's this problem of this idea that when the artist is, um, this, this idea he's pushing against, which is that he's not the kind of artist to make a work in his studio and deliver a final product to a museum or an institution, and that you kind of, you know, if you're gonna do a Jason Road show, you inherited him and all his materials and this ongoing process. Um, and, and you have to be a part of it somehow. Yeah, and but also dealing with this idea that like the opening would happen and the viewers would come in to celebrate and then the artist would, would believe and it was out out of the equation at that point and he wanted to create a space where he could stay and continue to produce yeah. and and it was it, it's like a myth to him that 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 this cycle the system and he's kind of modeling the system of the art world too in a way in the work like he's presenting the artist studio you can come up on a lift and have a studio visit with him <laughs> there's the viewers there's the work hanging on the wall in a more traditional manner um, this kind of institutional critique, I think, is really um, important to the work. It, it does seem, though, that like at the, in this, there's this piece, and then, you know, it, then you have what happens later, and then you have Black Pussy at the at this last period, and it did seem that, you know, he talks about putting. You know, in a sense, the artist taking control, the artist taking control back yeah. to become the artist is in control, rather than. And at this point, the, you know, in a lot of ways, you could say, unless you break away or go off, the museums and the boards of the museums are in control, and they dictate what art is and what art gets shown. So. How does the artist take control of this language called art? And I think at the end with Black Pussy, he makes the piece in his own studio. And, you know, even though he might have put it back into a gallery in some ways, I think he was sending some sort of message to the dealers, to you know, did he have a message to the museums? I don't know, but to the dealers, yes. And but wasn't it, Proposition the piece right after, where, which dealt exclusively about the role of the artist and the dealer? Yeah, well, oh, the yeah, piece was, was yeah, it was yeah. me. I mean, that piece was like the joke piece on the gallery. <laughs> and, but I, I think, you know, it's hard to know where he would have, you know, the the things he was talking about before he died, I think had something to do with how do we create, as, as an artist, how would he create his own world where, in a sense, you know, the, he goes above, up in there, and it is in the museum, it is in the Doxer Hall and in a lot, but he's created the first model for where his position would be, or a position for the artist. And it might have been that the future, or I've, I've often thought my own projection onto the whole thing is that Jason was trying to figure a way of, for the artist to take, in, in his own subjective way, his own world, how does he take control back? And, uh, it, so I, I kind of think it's, it's a question. I think it's, in a lot of ways, that perfect world and the work that 
he was doing towards the end did have something to do with the position of the artist in relationship to not only culture, but to the control of art. Very, it's a projection. Yeah, I think that's sense. really true. Um, I think Perfect World was pushing the institution. You know, in um, Creation Myth, you see that he's rebelling by um, breaking these lines, these slits in the wall. And then with Perfect World, he's pushing the institution almost to the brink of collapse with what it can handle. And then it leads to this moment with Black Pussy where he just exits the institution and takes control. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll ask a question also about the lifts in the show, in the piece, which um, you see in the film, and um, selected visitors could could get on these lifts and ride up to the upper level, as been has been mentioned. Um, and I wanted to ask about this um, maybe tension between. Uh, evoking like a uh, literal physical hierarchy in the piece and also this tendency in Jason's work of flattening hierarchies which you see over and over again I think it's really well um, modeled in my brother Brancusi where he compares um, a sculpture of Brancusi's endless column or to the bedroom of his brother so this idea of like flattening um, democratizing something that's seen again and again in his work. Um. I don't think it was a selection of people. It was, it was only, it was not, he, he didn't say you cannot go up and you can go. It was just, it, there was a limited access. So it, it, it was only two people or like two by two times two people who could go up and, and visit. He didn't want this crowd visit, he just wanted to have communication with one or two people. So it was not a very... It was an exclusive. No. Uh. <laughs> Oh, go ahead. No, you Okay. Uh, I again, I I I, I wish I'd seen it because I I didn't, but I um, I interpret it from a distance as as a thing that's not it's not about it's 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 again it's never it's all I I feel like with Jason he never go he never picks an extreme you know in a binary he never goes to one or the other, and so he's not making a work that's democratic and he's not making work that's elitist. He's simply saying, he's simply actually um, saying that, that the conditions of the work are such that only a few people can see it in a given time. And, and that, uh, what that does is, it, is it, it sort of reflects back on how we, the conditions we create for viewing works in galleries, but also in institutions, you know, we've, we were very comfortable with the idea somehow, I mean, most of us, that you can go see a show with, um, like the Venice Biennial, with I don't know how many hundreds of artists, I don't know how many hundreds of works, and see it in like a day and a half or two days. And, and maybe there's a way in which, in which the, the, the equation that he builds up with Perfect World just simply shows, it's not that the Perfect World is, is a, is a piece that that's difficult. It's just that the perfect world shows the difficulty of sh <laughs> of showing a piece. You know, it's it, he's he's making a work that gives a lot physically, materially, intellectually, theoretically that has all these different things to offer. But in order to see it, um, and that's something he keeps coming back to. The the viewer has to s sort of you know put in some not necessarily work, but pl interact and make a commitment and spend time and maybe wait in line or come back or um, he's, he's simply, um, he's letting the work kind of set its own conditions and, and maybe, um, I don't know, I had, I, it's a, a just a, a feeling more than anything else but I also had the feeling that when he went from the early pieces that I saw him do at UCLA where he would, he could really sometimes take on a persona, but always be next to the work talking and having this kind of intimate reaction, re relationship with whoever came in to the moment where he could no longer do that like in this show because the volume of people coming through, the fact that he had to be elsewhere, they can, all these different things. 
that are just realities, at that moment he kind of gives agency over to the piece and then it's almost like the piece is, is, is saying, sometimes even just physically, like with a shaky lift that only takes two people, the piece is saying I can't have more, you know, and that's, and then that creates an intimacy and that creates a, and that creates a different space in the institution. You can't just walk in and out. It, it kind of, I know that in, in the, as I recall, it, I think he said that the bottom and the top were equals. So it's, he didn't see it as a hierarchy. It's, you know, all of a sudden, only so many people get to go up. So then there's some sense of at least some type of selection or privilege or you wait in line and who can wait in line but he saw it as a, an equal in a way and not a hierarchy but I would, it's also that you know I was thinking that like as you have a show and then there's all that stuff back there that made the show <laughs> and nobody a lot of people don't get to see that you know, like how the object got made, or what happened, or where it was made, or what went. So, in a lot of situations, you have what's seen and what's not seen. And do we think of these as hierarchies? And if you put them in a space, you know, he was kind of, it's, it's in a, that space up there is an ephemeral, an ephemeral space for to go up into for him to be in. Maybe not much different in a certain way the studio. You know, I think in the, the original plans he was going to have it as a studio, and then it turned into a way more of a, a perspective or a, 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 a space, an ether space of some sort. And uh, so I, it, it does kind of pose some questions of hierarchy, but I'm not sure that we don't exist in certain types of things like this. And I don't know whether we think of them all as hierarchy. You know, like I don't think that space up there determined anything about the space down below. In fact, I think at one point he even refers to you go up in the thing and you look down onto a plane like this table and you look down and what makes up that flat plane that the, the, the garden sits on is the viewer down below. So in one way, from a certain perspective, it's quite the opposite. What's making that object is the viewer down below. So it, you know, there's yeah. like things that start twisting in there that uh, I think uh, kind of shatters this notion of, uh, of a hierarchy in a certain way, other than only s certain people. When I, uh, and it went 35 feet, and it really was pretty, actually pretty scary up there. <laughs> It really, and it was, oh, what part that was interesting to me is, is that when you went up through, you would go up through, you know, you might go up through a layer of one of these, you know, golden rule triangles, but you could be going where there was just a piece of paper, and then you'd get above it, and you were looking at what appeared to be somewhat of an actual floor, that illusion. So what there was was really an illusion of a floor or an illusion, you know, and then underneath it was 15 feet down, you know, <laughs> so there was something about, you know, a kind of, uh, you were looking at something that almost wasn't there, you know. But this, uh, what he also is, uh, talks about uh, wa walking on paper, on yeah, this Kung yeah. Fu, the Kung Fu uh, series, situation series. where he walks, where, where Kung Fu walks on paper. Uh, <laughs> Is that a situation that artists feel when they, mm, throughout their career, that sometimes they walk on ground, solid ground, and sometimes they walk on paper? Would that be a metaphor for the dangers in yeah. creativity? Sure. 
I, you know, he also talks about traps and yeah. the trap. And, and I think that because you can't, if you're making art in one way, you're, what's behind you may be more solid or you may be looking back, but what's ahead of you might, you're not really sure what's ahead of you. And uh, you're not really sure of where it's going to take you, or and in his case, the work is so much about where it takes him or where he takes it. But it's a it's a fragile game, you know. But also in that in that pat, the kung fu part, he talks about creating something that's like a real life situation where you like you, what you were saying with it. He says, "Oh, you could walk and then fall through and literally die." Yeah. Um, and, and uh, I, I remember uh, when I was working the essay, I don't know, somewhere, he talks about how he's always putting out this technology, like videos and TVs and stuff, and sometimes things break, and that's a big problem when you will show work and an element breaks, but um, somehow that's, that's kind of what happens in life with appliances, and he thought it was interesting. But to communicate that as an interesting thing, you know, that someone could work something could work for a certain amount of time and then break, or that, that you know, the platform could be safe in parts and not in other, um, that goes against the idea we have of, of an artwork as a stable thing, you know, which, which at the basis is, is something, whether it's materially or also conceptually, that he was always undoing and redoing, undoing and redoing, and then kind of shifting and, do you think that's also reflected um, in the system of poles? Like, you come in and there's this web of, what is it, five miles of aluminum yeah. poles, and he talks about this being related to Duchamp's first papers of surrealism show in 1942 in New York, where he strung 16 miles of yeah, twine through the gallery. So this experience that the viewer has of coming in into this kind of web and um, maybe the piece like overpowering you and getting lost in it. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot about like the, the architecture that he creates in the body's relationship to the sculpture. Because um, you were saying you have to walk, yeah, you, I don't remember, you were saying you have to walk under and like Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and I felt, so I went there with, with several friends and you have the feeling that you don't get what you paid for <laughs> <laughs> because you really want to be up there and you could not say I saw the show if you haven't been up there right. and so you t it, it was like a cheap seat for <laughs> something so it, you missed something if you didn't uh, it, maybe I, it also created this desire yeah. to go up no you felt a little bit oh I didn't see the whole thing no? <laughs> a hierarchy but, yeah. but then when, like when longing, you were, maybe long or desire or I don't know. Yeah, you, but when when you were up there, you then uh, am I right to think that when you were up there, you couldn't see what was underneath? Like you, well, you could because there were holes. Oh, you could, there were holes. Okay, which was pretty interesting. You know, <laughs> we like, haven't talked about these garbage cans and the holes and this. Jason talks also about this ecosystem that he's creating in the work, and that the garden is an ecosystem, but also this this play between um, creating waste with a sculpture and recycling material um, because yeah, the bottomless garbage cans le led to the next level and also he recycled these materials in, he said he was going to reutilize these materials for the next 35 years and recycle. So uh, is that something he talked about at that time in relation to his work in this creating an ecosystem? Well, Recycling, but Recycling. yeah, and then in the end, you know, how successful was all that? You know, I don't. Because I think he he also relates. He used to a lot of it, but I think in the end, I don't know whether you know a lot of it didn't get reused. I think. You know. I don't think "recycle" is the right word. He would use it. He would distribute Repurpose. it into different yeah. sculptures, but recycle is would not be the right word. He no, used that no, word, a, though. Huh? He used yeah, but that was for garbage, no? Well, I think okay. he also related it to this morality yeah. thing, like the morality he, of needing to recycle and that yeah. his sculptures created waste, but that he felt that waste <laughs> was a metaphor for our culture. Yeah, yeah, he revolted recycling. Yeah. So he, well, there it is. He, he 
he like to throw things out? <laughs> well, and I think it also feeds into this question of like, did Jason bring an American sensibility in a way into this exhibition in Europe and how his work in general kind of cross reference and interest in European culture and American culture? I, I think to a degree, you know, there's a, uh, Europe has a romanticism about a California and America, so to some degree, Jason's success, you could say, has something to do with him being a California person, right? And on the other hand, it goes the other way, of course, too, but on the other hand, I think that's maybe had some to do with his success in the art world, but I think actually that's not a very important part. It's, it, it, yeah, he did kind of transplant American, you know, he took the car there. He, so there was that, but I think in another way, it's really, for me, it's that Europe could, it had, Europe had a, a structure, especially at that time, where there were a lot of places you could show, it still is, but, and there was support for the artists from governments and, and there was an understanding of the work. And uh, I think that he was able to make work there and, uh, in, and that that part about the Americana although it played some part in it all, I don't think it's the critical point. I think it's that they saw something in the work, the, the directors, and they would, that was a, I mean, you look at the scale of that thing and the commitment even to, to the Dr. Holland to do it is pretty incredible, like that they decided to do it, even though when, at one point it completely crashed and probably other people had to come in and help support the thing, but uh, it's not a piece that would have ended up in uh, too many museums in America. And uh, right there, there's a commitment to something, and uh, I think it's a commitment to that type of work and to that to a process. I mean, he, he told them, uh, you know, there's this whole thing about like how much, you know, like it's a gamble, like, okay, here's the date, here's when the show opens, and then you start this process, and that date of that opening, it, as the process goes on, is insignificant at one point. I think Jason wasn't worried whether the piece was up when the opening happened, if half of it was up, if the process went, if it started, and that kind of uh, acceptance and commitment by an institution is, I mean, now, now it's so conservative, right? The, the idea that you wouldn't make the opening? Jesus. <laughs> yeah, but he even, said, you. he even said he might as well take, uh, take it down already before yeah, the opening. Yeah, before the opening, yeah. yeah. If it couldn't be, if you can polish it too. Right. So. Which is really interesting. Right. Like it's an interesting idea that, you know, this, uh, like that, you know, the idea that you might take it down before it goes <laughs> yeah. out. But, but no, uh, just one word. Yeah. Uh, but there was this show of these 500 drawings, and that's not to be underestimated. Right. I mean, it, it was a show, but it was also, like he calls them, the tools that, that had that function. It was not a display, it was, and also like you uh, pointed out when we watched the film, he installed these drawings first and then he did the, uh, the, the construction. So it was almost like mapping for, for the, or like instru yeah, instruction for the construction. So it was, otherwise, I mean, it would have been more prudent to put the drawings later, no? but yeah. he put the drawings first. Uh, I, I was just thinking when you, you were talking about America and Europe, I, I always thought that the, the way um, 
Jason work, but also it's something you can say a lot about a lot of things that happen in California. There's, I mean, it, it's a kind of simplistic metaphor or, or caricature, but um, there's a way in which, like, you know, California is, is a sort of extreme of whatever we call the West. It's sort of an outer limit. And it's not that it's an outside, it's just that like you have the same narratives and you have the same cultural references, but they get kind of stretched. And then they get sort of deformed and there's a bit of space that you don't have, for example, in New York. And, um, and um, the, there's a way in which Jason was, like in the My Brother Brancusi, like he's, he's taking things from Europe you know, from art history, from what, from, from what, um, what came from Europe into the United States and started, you know, the history of modern contemporary in the U.S. And he 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 stretches it by he he translates it into his own context and his own idiom, but he translates it in a way that that kind of alters both things. You know, all of a sudden you do kind of see his brother's bedroom in relation to Brancusi, but you do also see Brancusi in relation to something like his brother's bedroom. And then, you know, he, he had a, a way of, of, yeah, or, or putting everything on the same plane, you know, Home, Home Depot and, and, and something from art history and something from technology and something happening in his life and the installation, they're all elements. And, um, and, and, question of saying what's the predominant thing or what the hierarchy could or should be was not simply not a problem that he was interested in dealing with. It was not a question for him. He was interested in other things, in connecting them and relating them, and in relating them in, in ways that kind of warped everything, you know. Um, and, and, yeah, I don't know. I think there's something of, of, about that you can see in a lot of, or that I think about when I yeah, in terms of what happened in California. And, and well, I have a lot, <laughs> a lot of questions still to ask, but maybe we should also take some questions from the audience, if there are some. Yes? Uh, something that really struck me in this discussion was about this idea that as a viewer, what you perceive to be a roof over your head suddenly becomes the floor of some other process. Um, and all of what you get to experience is kind of a lift up into ascending into that space and then going back down to where, you know, what you guys described as, um, I forget, but like the ma where the masses belong. And so I, I wonder if like, because I felt a certain level of antagonism toward me as a viewer and, his installation, and I wonder if any of you would be willing to talk about that relationship. I'm not, I, I think, yeah, maybe there is a bit of a, a bit, but I think at the same time it's about, I mean, he talks about wanting the viewer to come in into that space. But I think he, by creating that space above, he has the space for him to, to do the work, which, or to think about the work. So, and he's kind of saying, well, you can come up and see this, but it's where I, it's where I do this work up there. Right. Or this is where I think, or something. I, and I think like an ether of some sort. You go up into this ether of, of Jason, and I think it's, it, at that point it is his subjective and his own personal world, which, you know, we have that in our lives. And so it's like, in a way, he's putting that, it could be said, or I could think of it as, putting that into the space. I'm gonna put this into the space and I'm also gonna put this private space or how I see myself and how I can, you know, as, as him being an artist, how I see 
how that orange cord goes or those photographs go or it's my father here. And it's a private space also. And, uh, you know, so I think it's a delineation of a public and a private space to some degree. And, uh, and kind of saying, you know, look, if I let you in my bedroom, you're going to move my underwear or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, <coughs> he also talks about how um, you know, in, in, the, in, in the way museums or institutions function with an exhibition of that scale, and, and I think in that part, he's maybe thinking about something like a, or at least when I was reading it, I was thinking of something like a big group exhibition or even an art fair. Uh, there's a way in which we think that a, a big space should accommodate a lot of things that we can see in one place at one time and consume one after the other. And he's, he's flipping it around and making this big piece that fills up the whole space, but that then paradoxically demands a kind of intimacy. And he has, a, um, he has this passage where he says that that, that that idea that you could move a lot of people through a big space and have them see a lot of things um, is a false idea because that's not how culture works. That culture happens, I think he calls them like these micro explosions. He says there's like these micro explosions and he compares it to like when you hear a note in music, like just a note resonating or something. I, I didn't quite get that part, but anyway. Um, and I think that that's, 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 uh, that's really interesting too, because it's, it is, I guess, antagonistic, but I guess it's antagonistic if you think you can, I mean, and I'm not saying that's what you're thinking, but if you go in thinking, oh, I can go in, see the show, leave, um, he's saying there's always gonna be a residue. Whether you go up on the lift and see it from every possible angle, there's still going to be a residue. You know, there's still going to be something that, that will, is going to happen with that piece. There's still going to be something else. There's still another horizon. It's still, it still keeps shifting. Um, and that, that's not just like a, a theoretical claim. It's something he actually did, and that cost him a lot of work and effort to actually keep these things evolving and shifting and moving. And it's yeah, if you think of someone of trying to push that in today's world, today's art world, you know, the, the, the notion of opening a show and having to keep evolving um, in that way, uh, on that scale, is it, it, like, like Paul was saying, in, in today's environment, which in many ways is much more conservative, it's just, I don't know that it would work. And it, and it is remarkable that he, he found spaces and ways of making that work. Um, so I, I don't know if it's antagonistic in a way, it's also simply, it's simply also showing a reality of, of engaging with, with the work of that complexity. You can't just see it in one afternoon, you know, it just doesn't work that way. Um. Any other questions? You mentioned complexities and all the different layers that are part of this work. I was wondering how much the specific location is uh, potentially an influence on this work as well. But if I look at the diagram and the, the space, the way it's laid out, he's really cutting off the, the basic quality of the space, which is the wonderful windows and the daylight that's coming in. It seems like, I haven't seen the, the exhibition itself, but it seems like it's being cut off by this platform. So you feel like all of a sudden in the basement, and only if I make it to this elevator, I get to see this wonderful quality of daylight. I mean, do you think that was, might have been part of this thinking as well? I wonder how much the specific side the building influence also this approach. Yeah, he spoke of the, this uh, dome as of a big tit. <laughs> <laughs> so that was his comment to the architecture. <laughs> It seems like that big space, you know, yeah, there are the windows, and those are nice and everything, but it's also that big space gave him the opportunity to make that type of work. So in a way, you, I could look at it and say, well, 
yeah, the windows get closed off, but what's really great is the big volume, and you can make a piece like this. So, in one way, yeah, it goes both ways, you know what I mean? I, just, I see it like, and there is something, I guess, you could say, and he probably was really aware that by putting that ceiling, it made it darker down below, and when you went up, you were in the light, you know? So there is, a, there is an image there that, by doing that, but I think it's, I, I mean, I was, I had this, thought, I, I mean, I, and I don't think it has much to do with Jason, and I, I don't think so, but uh, I, a while back I was in Turkey and, and went to the Blue Mosque, which is really incredible, and then and I thought of Jason's, this piece, because the mosque has this huge dome, and there's the, the carpeted floor where they can pray, but there's a chandelier, a massive chandelier that covers the whole space. And as, uh, as someone in the space underneath to pray, you're in a layer, kind of like the, the perfect world. And then, but you can see up through the chandelier into this massive open ether space. This, uh, and then I remember, and I don't think Jason, I have no idea whether, I don't think Jason saw the Blue Mosque. I'm not sure. He, he was in Egypt, but I don't know whether he was in Turkey. Did he? Somebody's shaking their head, but <laughs> I, I thought it was just interesting. It made me think of, it's a little off the subject, but it, it did make me think of uh, Jason's work and uh, Perfect World as well as the pieces that came later, you know. Yeah, in the back. Um, the, the over view pictures of the um, uh, layout look to remind me of the um, buckminster the full of Dymaxian maps when you talk about flat packing, triangle, triangular shapes of the works. And I was wondering, when you mentioned domes just now as well, I'm thinking of triangles and those buckminster that full of yep. domes. And I wondered if he was, that was something he was interested in or that he discussed with you guys as well as we didn't talk about the triangles and the golden sections um, <laughs> and all yet. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I know that he was working with an architect, Mark McManus, at the time, and I don't know. I think Mark had something to do with the engineering of all that, and yeah. I don't know whether the triangles were related to that, but the Dymaxian map, I mean, I don't know whether... He was certainly aware of that, but I don't know yeah, what Yeah, the it triangles is. were all designed in the golden mean. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he was he, he talked about the like uh, this also this pulley system uh, as the oldest engineering uh, uh, like Egyptian engineering oh, yeah. architecture. And the like pyramids. how they brought, But you mean the triangles like the platforms and the two triangles? Because the tubes no, the are also platforms. triangular Aren't the, oh, but also the not, supports, yeah. doesn't he have, they're trying, I, in the uh, yeah, I yeah, but he was really so. interested in this idea of the golden mean and right. that it was related to the building of the pyramids and these basic structures, it's earlier traditional forms of building things. Yes. Um, but, but I think the triangles are the poles down before yeah. Yeah. is to give it sheer strength. You right. Know, like the sheer... You know. but yeah, he, it was mainly for... For stability. Oh, yeah. But I didn't know if those were also golden mean. No. no. <laughs> but I think he also relates the golden mean to Sutter's Mill in a way, which is a piece that comes after this. Well, no, it came before this piece, but the um, discovery of gold, the gold rush in America. And he's always making these connections between things in his work, but. Um, the golden mean's relationship to the. Uh, monument also, I think, begs this question of the piece of like, is he building his own monument in a way? Like, is, it a, is the piece a monument in the way that the pyramids have become a monument? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. 
I mean, <laughs> I mean, it, yeah. I thought one thing that uh, that was interesting about Sutter's Mill, which had, I think, has to do with uh, something to do with him and his process, but him talking about that uh, the gold was all around them and no one could see it. And then all of a sudden, one person sees the nugget, picks it up, and then realizes that it's all around them, that it's right there. You could pick it up, you could dig for it. It was, it was there. And this, and making that, that Sutter's Mill also had to do with what we can't see that's all around us, or like a perception and uh, an insight. And uh, that Sutter's Mill is a type of metaphor for an insight. Are there any other questions? Good. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, well, thank you all for coming and for participating. Thank you.